Good evening. When I read this passage, and whenever I read this passage, I wonder why Jesus had this long conversation and does this whole get your husband gotcha moment. Yeah, while knowing he has something this woman probably wants and maybe even needs. And if he knows her story, if he is the son of God, if he is a prophet, then he also knows the unjust systems that put her in this position in the first place. And it reminds me of government assistance programs that require people to attend financial planning classes to get the resources that they need, as if the people who are attending these have not learned how to make pastas and rices and potatoes stretch a meal. And as if those people don't understand that they are already walking or riding a bike or taking buses to cut the cost of commuting in the first place. When the real problem is that minimum wages haven't been raised since 2009. But props to Massachusetts for bumping up to $15 an hour in 2023. And at the same time, we know that it takes $40 an hour, 40 hours a week, all year long, with no major illnesses or major costs that cut into being able to afford rent. Not own a home, just pay rent. This conversation between Jesus and this woman feels like a power move, and I do not like it. Jesus says, if you knew the generosity of God and who I am, you would be asking me for a drink, and I would give you fresh living water. So give it. And then he says, everyone who drinks of your well will be thirsty again and again and again. But if you drink this water that I have, you will never thirst again. So give it. When I read this, I thought, Jesus got it wrong. <laughs> and we have to be able to admit when we get it wrong when our people get it wrong. And I think the writers of this text are inviting us to wonder, what did go wrong here? What contributed to this moment? Why does the Jesus who turns water into wine for the people, flips tables and kicks people out of the temple for profiteering off of sacrifices, the Jesus who heals people for just having the need of it. Why would this Jesus have this woman figuratively take the stand? How often has she been made to take the stand? Had her private life on display? And how often is she believed? What has she endured? I think a couple things went sideways. I wonder if Jesus started to feel himself just a little bit. You know, he's the known leader of a movement and maybe needs to be reminded of what solidarity looks like. I wonder if Jesus got sidetracked for a moment and needs to pause and self-evaluate. I wonder if he needs friends his people, to check him and hold him accountable to their values. Jesus came so that people might have life abundantly. Not so their stories could be told for everyone, not so they would have to justify their lives to everyone, but so that they could have an abundant life. I am multivocational. I'm a chaplain. And I work with the Eastern Massachusetts Abortion Fund, or the Emma Fund for short, and I help people access abortions. 
And as a chaplain, when someone is dying, when someone is ill, when someone says, can you be with me while my partner, while my child, while my parent is going into a procedure, I don't ask them, explain yourself. I say, okay. And we pray whatever prayer needs to be prayed, and we listen to whatever music is on their heart. May it, maybe it's a hymn, maybe it's R&B, but we do it. And when someone calls the Emma Fund for assistance with an abortion, we remove barriers to care. And we make that process as easeful and judgment-free as possible. We coordinate and pay for flights and trains and buses and hotels and lifts and childcare and abortions. And we specifically say, you do not owe us an explanation for why you've had to travel state lines and miss work and figure out child care to be able to get to mass or wherever. We say, what do you need? And how can we get you that, that money, that resource? And just like our guy Jesus, we're human and we make mistakes and we can do better. And we have to ask in different ways what could make this process better for you? What could make it easier for you? And we learn from our community. We practice mutual aid. As a community, we gather resources to meet each other's needs, and then we give them with no strings attached. Charity models, on the other hand, have lots of strings sometimes invisible strings. Charity models stem from the premise that those who are in positions to give have more expertise than the recipient. Put another way, rich people know what poor people need and how they need it and when they need it. Charity often requires that people answer personal questions or accept jobs that are exploitative. Many people often leave feeling stigmatized, feeling shamed or degraded when they leave charity. That is the opposite of solidarity. With charities, think of those federal packages, there's usually an air of debt and shame. Where charity models stick to band-aid solutions, Solidarity and mutual aid address underlying issues. When we ask questions, Jesus asked questions, but when we ask questions, we ask to get to the root of the intersecting problems so we can address them. I don't know that Jesus was doing that then. Jesus, churches, nonprofits, generous organizations, and generous people are often seen as good, perceived as innocent. And when that belief is strongly established, we can forget to check ourselves. We can forget to ask questions. And people might stop asking us questions, asking about our values, our values of justice and liberation and how they're aligning with our practices. And I think that Jesus had something like that happening. Jesus was a healer. You don't owe an insurance card or a copay or an ID, nothing to get care. So what happened here? Jesus fed people, quenched thirst, celebrated with people, listened to people, and journeyed with them. And when he went into the wilderness and experienced his own need for care, he was tended to by angels. When Jesus is in the wilderness, he's confronted with the chance to fix his own problems, meet his own needs. He is tempted to become the rugged individual that American values set us up to believe in. However, this Jesus in the wilderness rebukes that mindset 
refuses to cooperate with the idea that hard work on the part of the individual is all that's needed to overcome our problems. In his refusal to cooperate with the individual, individualism mindset, we see Jesus choose to rely on God, on the God of his ancestors, a God who is multiple and communal, all by God's self, to meet his needs. Jesus chose, to, chose the help of a divine community of God and angels to overcome the adversity rather than relying on his own miraculous powers. Jesus is the exception and yet chooses not to be exceptional in order to become a testimony to the power of collaborative problem solving. When Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well, he confuses his obligation to meet the needs of the community with his desire to see the community confess their needs. We need a meet the need Jesus rather than a confess your need Jesus. Jesus's power comes from his place within the community, not from his exceptional status or ability. If I remember correctly, Jesus could only work miracles in communities where people believed. The people have the power, not you, not me. We show the love of God when we participate in meeting the people's need, not when we get them to confess their need or their need for our service. Lent is a season to turn inward and examine ourselves in preparation for things to change. Jesus' time in the wilderness was a period of deep, deep reflection. And as he considered how his life and the lives of others would change, he considered how he would be a part of that change. He cooperates. He cooperates with change. He cooperates with God. He surrenders ego to a larger mission. In Parable of the Sower, Octavia Butler writes, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. Community, I invite us to think about what are you touching? What do you have access to that others don't? What are you changing and how are you participating in that change? What systems need to shift in your world? Family systems, friend dynamics, work operations. And where are you practicing solidarity and sharing resources? And importantly, where are strings attached that don't need to be there? We ask ourselves these questions as we prepare for resurrection, for something drastically different. How do you want your relationships, your community, your neighborhood to be different? And are you working toward that solidarity are you working with that solidarity in mind and in practice? And listen, it can be hard to feel all this change inside of ourselves in this deep period of reflection. But you don't have to do that alone. We all need support. We all need community to do something different. We need connection and experience. We need our people to have our backs, to hold us in care and accountability so we don't pull those gotcha moments when people are seeking us for support. 
In this season, as we journey with Jesus in preparation for the cross, tune into yourself and let God, let God's people, let the angels meet you as you ponder and prepare. And as we come to a close, I want to come to the very end of this passage where the woman at the well does something different with this news that Jesus has shared. She tells everyone. She goes to the community and tells them what she learned. She doesn't ask them to justify their needs. She doesn't give them a bunch of paperwork or forms to fill out. She gives it freely. No judgment, no strings attached. And she disrupts a pattern of hierarchy in old ways. And she does something new. And we can too. Amen? Amen. Amen.